Welcome to High Brown Low Brown, the show where our podcast hosts Steve Pahn and Dan Slattery pit high art against low culture. In this special biopic themed episode, we look at two films which celebrate the highs and lows in the lives of artists. Steve's pick is Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, in which Jennifer Jason Lee plays the titular Dorothy Parker, a gifted but melancholy writer who spent 10 years partying hard with the writers of the Algonquin Ground Table. Dan's choice is the rockumentary Anvil, which takes a look at the fortunes and misfortunes of Canadian heavy metal band Anvil. Once the darlings of the rock world, Anvil have fallen on hard times, but can a new European tour restore them to their former glory? Does fame and success bring the artist happiness? Listen up, dear listener, and we'll leave the final decision to you. Beware spoilers and enjoy the show. Well, good evening, dear listener. Welcome to another edition of Highbrow Lowbrow. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we're looking at biopics, two movies that tell stories of individuals you may or indeed may not have heard of. Do they pique your interest? Have a listen, see what you think. I'm going to talk about the musical metal gods that are Anvil later on in the show. But Steve is going to talk about something a bit more literary. Steve. Thank you, Dan. My highbrow choice for this episode is Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, directed by Alan Rudolph. It tells the story of the American poet and humorist Dorothy Parker and her personal and professional relationships with a group of writers who were known as the Algonquin Round Table. So it's 1920s New York. It is the Jazz Age. America is coming out of the horrors of World War I and it finds itself the most powerful country in the world. And there is a great desire for hedonism, I suppose, uh, for a lighter age of pleasure after the horrors of war. And it is the start of a literary and theatrical boom. There was something like 19 newspapers in Manhattan alone. There were thousands of newspapers across the country. There were hundreds upon hundreds of theatres in New York. And Dorothy Parker is working for Vanity Fair with the writer Robert Benchley. Now, Dorothy Parker is played by Jennifer Jason Leigh. Robert Benchley is played by Campbell Scott. They have wonderful chemistry. They have what might be described as a romantic friendship. It is always platonic because they are married to other people. But they are clearly in love with one another. And that love deepens and grows throughout the decades, but they can never be together as husband and wife. So this is a kind of funny, tender and, you know, slightly heartrending love story at the centre of this. But Vanity Fair is a very, they're in this tiny office. Benchley and Parker get very involved in union politics, which is, of course, even 100 years later, is still a big issue for writers working in the United States. It's a very small operation. And their editor, Frank Crowninshield, is played in a cameo by Peter Benchley, famous for writing a quite successful novel about an angry fish called Jaws. Peter Benchley is the grandson of Robert Benchley. In fact, the entire Benchley family is, is very distinguished, many writers and actors and cultural types. They start meeting at the Algonquin Hotel with other writers who were renowned at the time. Alexander Woolcott, who's this very borderline obese fat writer and very lacerating wit and Edna Ferber played by the lovely Lily Taylor. Many writers come and go. Will Rogers visits them. The Marx brothers, particularly Harpo Marx, are involved. Donald Ogden Stewart. Many writers and editors become part of this Algonquin round table where they meet every day for lunch at the Algonquin Hotel. And they have a special table made for them because there's a kind of funny scene where the waiter played by Wallace Shaw, who longtime highbrow lowbrow listeners will remember from My Dinner with Andre, and is the son of William Shaw, who was the editor of The New Yorker. In fact, the founding of The New Yorker is one of the little stories that's covered here that was founded by Algonquin members. They meet every day, they drink, they tell jokes, they drop bombos, they have wonderful witticisms. Goodness knows what happened to their livers. In fact, many of them didn't live that long, which might be saying something. They have very, very rich food. It's the height of 1920s indulgence. But behind the surface of these parties, there is tragedy. There is the through line of Dorothy Parker's love for Robert Benchley. Her first husband is a heroin addict. She has this tendency to fall in love with the wrong men. And her first husband physically abuses her. 
Her second husband, although thankfully he's not an abuser, it's clear they have a lot of problems. She actually married him twice. The story jumps between Hollywood, where Parker eventually moved, and those sequences are shot in black and white. It's clear that, she, like most of the Algonquin writers who moved to Hollywood, she had no faith in Hollywood as, as in any kind of uh, artistic hub. It was purely for the money. The Algonquin sequences, which are filmed in colour, in fact, the entire film was shot in 40 days in Montreal, where they found that the buildings maintained more of the kind of 1920s facade better than New York had. So she has an affair with... Uh, another writer who's also married, played by Matthew Broderick, here playing against type, because you don't usually see Matthew Broderick playing a cad. He actually plays the role quite well. It's one of his more challenging roles. She gets pregnant. She has an abortion, which is, of course, illegal at the time. She attempts suicide. And all the time this is going on, the, the party is still going on. They club together, they buy an island off the coast of Vermont, where they go, they play croquet all day, they play poker all night. But we see periodically Parker's poems, which Jennifer Jason Lee reads out in character, and these sequences are in black and white. And even though they're humor pieces, there's an actual real sense of melancholy to them. Dorothy Parker attempted suicide five times. She actually lived to be 73, a decent age still today, but was particularly decent in the 1960s when she eventually passed away. She deals with a lot of sadness in her life, and she channels that sadness into humour. In terms of the actual plot, I've pretty much told you everything there is, because this is a film where you, you, you pick up the tone. If you like the tone of the film, and if you're a writer, you're going to particularly love this film, because it really gets into the writer's mindset. Not just of Parker, but of every other writer who turns up in it, and there's a lot of kind of war compacts. The personality, the mood swings between euphoria and desperation, the excessive drinking, the sense of uselessness when you can't work, the jealousy you have towards other writers who are just doing their job, and then the occasional moment of sheer bliss when you produce something or when you're in the zone with your writing and you can just phase everything else out of your life, often to the detriment of your family and your friends. All of that, I would say, as a writer, although I'm not a writer in, in Dorothy Parker's League, all of that, I would say, is absolutely 100% accurate. After I completed work on my biography of James Alroy, which regular listeners will know, I talk about a lot and was a big part of my life. I'd avoided biographies and I'd avoided films about writers for the longest time because I didn't want to be influenced. But I sat down and I watched a bunch of films about writers. And I have to say, this is the best. It is directed with a real short touch by Alan Rudolph. Rudolph himself had been obsessed with the Algonquin roundtable writers ever since he was a child because he'd seen the cartoons in Vanity Fair and the New Yorker, which became renowned. Of course, they're still going, although journalism and, and literature, I'd say, is in a much more desperate state now than it was then, but there's still time for another renaissance, I would say. So Rudolph wrote the script with a writer called Randy Sue Coburn. Rudolph began his career as a protege of Robert Altman, and there are many, many Altman-esque touches in this film. The overlapping dialogue, the general wit of the piece, the improvisation, the long tracking shots where we get a sense of story, but moreover we're getting a sense of period and, and tone and milieu. Rudolph has directed many good films. I like Trouble in Mind, which is a kind of spoof of, of hard-boiled films. And I particularly like his film, The Moderns, which is about the lost generation of American writers in 1920s Paris. That features Keith Carradine, who's a longtime collaborator with Rudolph. He's the De Niro to Scorsese's Rudolph. That film is actually a bit more fanciful. There's murder mysteries and slightly over-the-top elements weaved in. This plays it straight. Today, we'd probably call it a dramedy, but there's tragedy, there's wit, there's comedy, and it holds your attention the whole way through. At least it does for me. I, I think if you're a person who dislikes loosely plotted films, then perhaps you're not going to like this in the same way some people just don't like My Dinner with Andre. But if you love films with lots of wit, period detail, and particularly films about writers and about certain moments in the history of culture, you're going to really love this film.
it is sad it is funny and i return to it many times and always take something new away from it probably because there are so many writers name checked here that it's very very difficult to keep up the first time i watched it it didn't bother me that i didn't recognize all the writers and i'm most going like who's this guy again i've kind of forgotten then i watched a wonderful documentary called the 10 year lunch which was made five or six years before this one and actually won best documentary at the oscars that year and that was about the Algonquin Round Table. And it actually interviewed the very, very old last surviving members. It was good timing to get these people's voices down before they shuffled off this mortal coil. And you know what? They were still really witty and kind of <laughs> rather grouchy. But looking back uh, with a twinkle in their eye to a time when um, they were quite wild, I suppose. And that film, The Ten Year Lunch, really helps to put this film in context. I am a big fan of Jennifer Jason Leigh. Although this film received widespread acclaim, it was it actually failed at the box office on a $7 million budget. It only recouped $2 million. But this film went into production before the uh, financing had been secured. It was a real wing and a prayer production. In, in fact, Robert Altman, who produced it, who would encourage Rudolph to make the film, he actually went to several studios and says, I'm not making any more films unless this one is made. So the film got made. I felt it, it turned out great. It got great reviews. There were some rather snotty comments made about Jennifer Jason Lee's accent. If you've watched a number of uh, Jennifer Jason Lee films, particularly films like Kansas City, directed by Robert Altman, you'll notice she has a very distinctive voice. It's hard to describe. Some people find it really grating. I don't. I think that it works. She studied to the, I think, the only two audio recordings in existence of Dorothy Parker's voice. And I must say, I found one audio recording of Dorothy Parker's voice, and I don't think she actually sounds like her. But this is a performance. It is an impression. It's not to mimic. She sounds distinctive and she stands out from the rest of the class, uh, from the rest of the class, from the rest of the cast. Having just popped on a Jennifer Jason Lee interview on YouTube to pick up a natural voice, she's got, you know, a lovely natural voice, as, as did Dorothy Parker, who, to my mind, sounded almost like an upper class English woman. She could be an aristocrat or a member of the royal family or something. She sounded a bit like the Queen. But it's fair to say that uh, Jennifer Jason Lee's voice is a controversial point. In fact, there was a false rumour started that she had to go back and re-record scenes because test audiences didn't understand her. But she said that that was just a very mean-spirited rumour started. She only went back to do some looping, which is standard procedure for films. I should probably wrap up by saying that this film has the best cast of practically any film I've seen. Not only do we have some, you know, veteran actors in it, but we also have many people at the start of their career who go on to do great, great things. Actually, Jennifer Jason Leigh and Campbell Scott were both relatively early in their career. Campbell Scott, his Robert Benchley is slightly doer figure. He has to be. He's a man trapped by the conventions of his time. He can't be, he's not one of the wilder members of the circle. He's not indulging in affairs or anything like that. He's just got his tender romance for Dorothy Parker. Of course, Campbell Scott is the son of George C. Scott and Colleen Dewhurst, who were both very fiery performers. And Campbell, like many of us, didn't really acquire the personality of his parents. He's become his own man. And I'm actually a bit of a Campbell Scott fan. I, I do really like him. I particularly like I think it's the only film he's directed, he co-directed with Stanley Tucci, who's also in this. Uh, Stanley Tucci has a wonderful scene at the end where he plays a baseball player and actor who spots Dorothy Parker in a bar and wants to be inspired by her, but unfortunately her alcoholism, she's too far gone. Campbell Scott and Stanley Tucci directed a wonderful film called Big Night, which is a comedy about Italian-Americans running a restaurant in, in New York. It's quite lovely and wonderful and funny. Matthew Broderick, as, as I said, playing against type. Peter Gallagher, the lovely Jennifer Beals. Lots of beautiful women in this. Gwyneth Paltrow, Heather Graham, Lily Taylor. Uh, we also have Stephen Baldwin, uh, Rebecca Miller, who is the daughter of Arthur Miller, the dramatist, and is married to Daniel Day-Lewis. In fact, there's a lot of American blue bloods in this, uh, as I've said, like Peter Benchley, Wallace Shawn. These are people who are part of big families. There's Nick Cassavetes. So people who are part of these big cultural families that have been very, very important to American literary, cinematic, theatrical culture. And it's really just a who's who of American cinema, and yet made on a shoestring. 
which is a real achievement. I mean, practically, I think it's highly unlikely you'd see a film like this get made today. And it was difficult as enough as it was in the 90s. And I think this was the high point of Alan Rudolph's career. Some of his films he's done since then, like Breakfast of Champions, which is an adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut novel, have done very badly, critically and commercially. But Vonnegut is difficult to adapt. You know, he made some wonderful films. I think he's quite old now. I'm not sure if he's still making films, but he certainly can be very, very proud of this one. I think it's a wonderful film. And like several of the films I recommend, I, I know it's not for everyone. You know, we've done horror. We've done a number of genres that aren't, aren't for everyone. But I would feel like if you can only watch one kind of literary period film a year, Please make it this one. Mrs. Parker in the Vicious Circle. It's a wonderful film that captures a time and a place very splendidly. And it brings me, and as many fans, it's got a cult following, a lot of happiness every time we put it on. It's my highbrow recommendation of this week. Sterling job, dear boy. Well done. Thank you. I have to say, watching this, and I know I jokingly referred to myself as a cultural knucklehead, but I did have a, a case of imposter syndrome because I thought, I know absolutely nothing about these people. Um, I mean, I've heard of Dorothy Park and some of the witticisms that came out, I thought, oh, right, OK, that's where that phrase gentlemen seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses comes from. But yeah. I think I would get so much more out of this if I knew, if I'd read any Dorothy Park or any of the other authors, and I haven't. To be fair, it's not a genre or a period in literature that interests me. Now, that's not to say it's a bad movie. It's not. But I think it's definitely one for the fans. And I suspect that's why there was a struggle to get it made and why it struggled to find an audience, because I just thought this is very niche. If you know the people, then you're going to get a lot out of this movie. And thank you for recommending the documentary, The 10 Year Lunch. That was a very good primer for then watching the movie. But I just thought this isn't a movie for me because I have no interest in this period of literature. That's not to say it's a bad movie. It's not. And it deserves its high ranking. It's well made. And Jennifer Jason Lee's great in the role and the supporting cast are all very good. I mean, there are some shock moments, the bit where Andrew McCarthy suddenly slaps her, took me by surprise. But then, like you say, that he was an abusive husband. It was good of Altman to really push to get it made. And it was a film that deserved to be made. And it's an interesting story. But does it make me want to run out and read Dorothy Parker? No, it doesn't. I'm sorry to say, Steve. But did I feel yeah. my time was wasted watching it? No, I mean, I didn't. I wasn't sitting there bored or twiddling my thumbs or thinking, oh, what a bunch of pretentious people. I think it's great, though, that they were able to keep the circle going for 10 years. That's quite something. Yeah. You know, that, that's an achievement in itself. And if they're remembered for nothing else, the 10-year circle or the 10-year lunch, to use the name of the documentary, is just genius. If only we had the time and the money to do that, Steve. Although I well, indeed, that. yeah. I mean, there's some pretty good restaurants in Liverpool. I'd love to go there every day. Although yeah. I, think, I think the staff would get sick of seeing me. Yeah, I'm sure they got sick of seeing. Uh, but then Wallace Shawn is so good at playing kind of hempecked, either flustered bureaucrats or you, you know, he's so good at portraying kind of agitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really funny. I would say in terms of the writing, I mean, I I wasn't an expert going in, and I'm still not an expert today. I'm more of a casual fan. Dorothy Park is easy to dip into because they're poems. And then I watched Robert Benchley's famous Treasurer's Report sketch. <laughs> which the first time I watched Kemble Scott doing it, I I was just like, I, I, I'm not getting this at all. And then suddenly it all just kind of twigged and it became very funny. It's kind of gets a bit funnier every time I watched it. Unfortunately, our treasurer, sorry, no, our treasurer is unfortunately ill type stuff, the kind of flustered bureaucrat he does very well. As for people like Alexander Wolcott, he was a critic and I'm not sure how well critics work ages you know, I'm not. I don't really want to read reviews of plays that were being performed in the 20s and have never been staged again. I only have so much free time, and therefore I choose my reading fairly carefully. And writers like Edna Ferber became big in Hollywood. Lily Taylor, who I'm a big fan of, plays Edna Ferber in this, and I was surprised at some of Edna Ferber's credits. For instance, Showboat, the 1926 version. That's how she wrote the novel to that. Like I say, it, it kind of meanders a bit, and it's about the period. For instance, there's one scene where they're in a speakeasy. You know, it gets raided by the cops, and they have to get out, and then uh, Matthew Broderick shows his um, smooth talking chops by uh, going back in, retrieving the bag, getting Robert Benchley's hat, and even, and even getting a bottle of booze out of there, all under the noses of the police. So it's got this kind of charm to it. 
But Dan, can I ask you, uh, one, are you a Jennifer Jason Lee fan? And two, did her voice bother you? Her voice didn't bother me at all. But then I don't know what Dorothy Parker's voice sounded like, so I've got nothing to compare it to. But as an accent, I didn't grit on the ear. Um, to give you an example of one that did grit on the ear, Kevin Costner playing Jim Garrison in JFK. I mean, I didn't know what Jim Garrison sounded like, but that accent really annoyed me. And to be fair, I don't think the real Jim Garrison sounded anything like that. So the accent in itself, I thought was fine, but because I had nothing to compare it to, but obviously people who know Dorothy Parker, what she sounds like really well, maybe had an issue with it. I don't expect actors, if they're doing a biopic, to get an accent bang on. I just think if I wanted to see a really accurate portrayal, I'd watch a documentary. I think if you're going to do a biopic, Unless you're doing that Marilyn movie, Blonde, which is just a kind of complete re reinterpretation of her life, I do think some poetic license in portrayal and probably accent is allowable. So I don't have a problem with that. I haven't plucked up the courage to watch Blonde yet because I've heard it's pretty horrific, like one rape after another. And there was a part of me that just felt like, well, what's the point? But I really should just watch it and then decide for myself. Have you seen it? I have seen it, and it certainly wasn't as bad as I was led to believe. The remake of Dead Ringers with Rachel Weisz was far more gory. But you know what? I didn't find Blonde offensive. I just found it dull. I was bored watching Blonde. I wasn't offended. I wasn't horrified. The only reaction it got out of me was, this is boring. I just don't care. There was a documentary on BBC Two. I think it might still be on the iPlayer, about Marilyn Monroe's life being reinterpreted by female actors. And it is a far more interesting and revealing watch. Blonde is, well, I mean, it's directed by the same guy who did Chopper. Now, what does that tell you? No. Chopper is hilarious for all the wrong reasons. And this is just, yeah, it's. I didn't find it offensive. I just found it dull. And that is possibly the worst thing that I can find in a movie. At least if I found it offensive, it would have provoked some reaction. Don't bother, Steve. Unless you feel you should. It's based on a book which itself is saying it's a reinterpretation of her life, so it's not even accurate. Again, there, I know there were complaints about Anna Darnus's accent and that, but like I said, people know what Marilyn sounds like. And even as an actor, she didn't sound like that. Norma Jean didn't sound like Marilyn Monroe. So I think actors like Anna Darnus, who are playing her, if she, she doesn't get her accent bang on, so what? Now, you know, as long as she's kind of in the ballpark and it's not yeah. terrible. I would sooner have an accent that sounded nothing like well, with the exception of Kevin Costner and Jim Garrison, obviously, rather than have somebody really struggling to hit the accent, if they at least kind of look like who they're trying to portray and get the mannerisms right. I think there are certain accents that, if unless you've got a real gift for accents, yeah. avoid. Now, in the case of Jim Garrison, you know, he was from New Orleans, so he had a deep South accent, and Kevin Costner is a bit of a wooden performer, both in voice and in other aspects of performance, really can't do deep South. And going back to a previous episode we've done, remember... Marlon Brando in Reflections of a Golden Eye makes a mess of the Deep South as well. So maybe that's one to avoid. Certainly the other one that springs to mind is Mel Gibson in Edge of Darkness trying to do a Boston accent. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. Oh. And then we've yeah. discussed, of course, the worst Irish accents, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Price, uh, Natasha McElhone and Ronan, uh, but Miranda Richardson, The Crying Game. Um, oh, oh, The Devil's Own. Brad Pitt in The Devil's Own. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> what, what a truly terrible movie. Well, why don't um, they hire, in those cases, those are all either English or American act actors, why don't they hire more Irish actors to play, uh, you know, Irish characters? Well, they had, was Adrian Dunbar, wasn't he, in The Crying Game, and Stephen Ray was in The Crying Game. I don't know why they don't do that. There's plenty of Irish actors they could use. All you have to do is watch some drama about the Troubles, and you see, you, you see the same cast come out. You think, oh, look, there's John Lynch is in again. There's Stephen Ray. Um, oh, we need, yeah. oh there, there is Brendan Gleeson, right? Okay. Uh, all we need is Jerry McSorley. Oh, there's Jerry McSorley. Well, there we are. <laughs> yeah. it, it kind of, it's like the, the Northern Ireland. But, well, a lot of them did start in local drama. And of course, bless me, we got Liam Neeson started in, you know, on the Northern Ireland stage. But you're right. One of the best uses of accent, I thought, was Enemy in the Gate, Alexander and Chernobyl. I thought they all were quite good. If you can do the Russian accent like Stellan Skarsgård can, fine. If you can't, is it the Polish workers who go in to clear out the radioactive rubble? The leader of them was Scottish. 
no chance of him doing a Polish accent. So they just end up speaking a Scottish accent. They identify them as Polish. And then because you're an intelligent viewer, you think, well, OK, they're Polish. It doesn't sound Polish, but I know they're Polish. In the same way that Alexander, the Macedonians speak with an Irish accent and the Greeks speak with an English accent. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, you know, rather than people well, are at war, to, so. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, rather than trying to attempt an accent, it's like watching Brigadoon, where the Scottish accents take in most of the British Isles. I think it does give the viewer a bit of intelligence to say, okay, we've told you that these people, you can imagine what they sound like, but we'd rather than have a whole range of accents, some of which sound good, some of which would just sound like Sam Neill in the hunt for Red October, lest we forget. You know, that's just, it, 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 it becomes unintentionally laughable. Really. Yeah. So no, to in a roundabout way of answering your question, Steve, I didn't have a problem with Jennifer Jason Lee's accent, but then I had nothing to compare it to. But then it didn't grate on the ear anyway. Redubbing is part and parcel of making a movie and shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. Sometimes there's just noise on the set, which they didn't hear at the time, and it comes out on the audio track and they need to read them. Same in TV drama. Reworking is a common thing. It's when they take it and reshoot it and re edit it, and then you think, Oh god, that now there's a problem. Yeah. Or the noise drowns out a pertinent piece of plot information. Hello, Heaven's Gate. You know, those are extreme examples. They didn't have the budget to do that. I mean, they barely had the budget to scrape through the principal photography here. So I, I'm just glad they got it right first time. I think it's Rudolph's best film of the ones I've seen. There's a couple I haven't seen. I saw Mortal Thoughts many years ago. I thought it was a pretty decent mystery drama. The Moderns is really good. It's like this film, but a bit more cartoonish, but not such a bad way if, if you accept that tone going again. It's really good. And I haven't seen Afterglow and some of his more recent efforts just, I think, have flopped. But definitely a, a protege of Robert Altman, and you can feel the Altman influence in, in pretty much every scene here. The one shot that made me think that is Sue Altman is when the credits are rolling and the camera pans around the entire table and then settles again on Jennifer Jason Leigh. I mean, it's a good shot, but I thought that is Sue Altman now. And maybe yeah. Altman suggested that's how he ended the movie. Anyway, wherever the idea came from, it's a well-executed shot. I think it's a lovely way to finish the movie. Has the age of the tracking shot died now with digital? I'm not I'm not sure. Is there any modern films that have great tracking? Maybe they're just done in different ways. Because they used to be done with a lot of hidden takes. A lot of them now might be done with either steady cam, so the camera operator's wearing the harness and then you can get right in and out. Or possibly you could set up uh, just a little, like on a table, a camera on a little motor and the motor just rotates the camera for you. But there's still a lot to be said for laying down the old train track, people pushing the camera, others doing the focus and whatever, just a whole team of people. Then again, dear boy, sometimes tracking shots, like if somebody's running down a road, it's just a cameraman sat in the back end of a van or a truck and somebody driving it. So sometimes tracking shots don't need to be too special. They can be done quite easily. I don't know. I think if it's well executed, then the tracking shots can be very good. And I would hate to see all kinds of craft be eradicated due to digital. Because in fact, in the early digital cameras, and you sometimes see this in early digital movies, if the camera pans really quickly left to right, there's actual shutter because the frame rate wasn't quite bang on. So you'll actually see like a kind of stuttering effect on early digital movies and certainly early football broadcasts that were done on digital telly. They hadn't quite got that ironed out. That was interesting on, on this rewatch. I was struck by how many these were writers who were on the left. In fact, I think at least one of them actually later became a socialist candidate, didn't get office, but they were involved in the formation of unions that are still active today. And with the writers' strike that has just been resolved now and the actors strike which is ongoing part of what the wga is worried about is ai taking their work and the studios are giving them no guarantees about how they're going to use ai and another thing that occurred to me well, what you were just saying about how these things are shot is you know how unglamorous filmmaking is i mean it looks glamorous when you see the film premieres and everyone's in uh, giorgio armani or dior and they look great but the actual filmmaking process is very unglamorous it's just hard work and i've just been reading a hollywood thriller called everybody knows by jordan harper there's a great joke in it because you know if an actor gets a job on a set for three weeks and he goes there and, and nobody uh, is friendly to him it could be a very depressing experience there's a joke in it like how do you make an actor unhappy hire him and i thought that was just hollywood cynicism at its best definitely but then who was it said acting it's just a lot of standing around and occasionally saying your lines because uh, i'm not, not sure <laughs> because you know you have stand-ins i know for doing lighting shots but then you have camera tests and then 
you know, there might be some technical failure. I think AI could be used from a technological point of view, I think, to help get that tricky shot, possibly from a safety point of view. And I, I don't mean replacing by CGI, but motorized cameras aren't anything new. And why not use AI to calculate the optimum thing and then put it into the motorized camera? There's that or for pre-visualization. I can see why actors might think, oh, they just replace us with AI characters or whatever. But then, you know, replacing characters with animation, is that a new thing? Not really. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I do think uh, with any technology, there's always the fear of the loss of jobs. You only need to look at the synthesizer and the drum machine. The Musicians' Union was up in arms about them. And yet now they're kind of seen as part of certain bands' equipment. Well, I've just thought about the car industry, but that's a chilling thought. My wife's from Detroit. I've been there several times and the thought of Hollywood descending into some Detroit apocalypse. I can imagine a few movie stars shuddering at that thought. The car industry built Detroit. It was once almost the richest city in America, but they blame robots as one of the many reasons the US car industry declined. The rise of the robots, dear boy. Maybe it's Sky Captain in the world of tomorrow wasn't too far-fetched, you know? Well, maybe. I mean, maybe we've got to watch our backs, Dan. I think maybe there'll be AI podcast hosts who are just waiting to show us the door. I did see on the recent update of Zoom, you can now have a Zoom AI companion in your meetings, Steve, but then Icon appears to let you know that the host is running the AI companion. I think the AI companion is useful if you want to draft a response, but you can't be bothered to type it yourself. So it's, it's getting in everywhere, Steve. I am not too fearful of it. I think any particular problems will happen well, 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 well down the road. I know we've got problems with possibly people using it to write essays. It's still not perfect. You can usually pick out the AI-generated stuff because it comes up with a lot of conclusions that are absolute rubbish and it makes up references. I'd be interesting to see how it develops. I'm not too scared by it, said he as he got taken over by the robots. But yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. said he as his Alexa suddenly went sentient and started. Well, I don't have a smart house, so it's not as if I can take over the cooker or anything. <laughs> I'm not going to get attacked by the washing machine. Well, I am going to get attacked by the washing machine, but that's because the weights are off in it. And every time it goes into the spin cycle, it chases me around the kitchen. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dear boy. Let's sure. move on to let's Anvil. Move on. Pretty uh, foundational technology in Anvil. Yeah. <laughs> is it a dead weight or is it burning alive, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Well, let me take you back to 1978, whenever Anvil started. It's always been two core members, Steve Lips. Oh, my God, what's his name? Sorry, Steve, I've just had a minor blank. I'm just going to... It's okay. I think anonymity is the band's problem, so it's rather yeah. appropriate. Oh, it's a cuddler. I should know that. Let me take you back to 1978 and the formation of Anvil with Rob spelt with two Bs to distinguish him from the director, Reiner, and Steve Lips, Cudlow, and when you see Steve, you'll know why he's called Lips. Stephen Tyler's got some competition on that front. So they formed in 1978, and then in 1982, a gig in the Marquee Club, a young teenager called Sasha Gervaisi came up to them, apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly, and said he was England's number one Anvil fan. So as a teenager, he subsequently became a roadie for them on their 1982, uh, 84 and 85 tours. He was Rob Reiner's drug technician. They nicknamed him T-Bag. I'm not quite sure if he got the double entendre at the time or not. Certainly during the more rock and roll moments, he was locked on the tour bus. Then what happened was they went their separate ways. And then he, around 2005, got in touch with them. He was now a documentary maker and thought he'd catch up with them to see where they're up to. And where they're up to is... Despite being headlining in the Super Rock Festival in 1984, along with the likes of the Scorpions, White Snake, Bon Jovi, the usual, you know, Megadeth, Metallica, Anvil had fallen off the radar. Now, whether that's down to per production on their albums, per management, who knows? But for a while, they were in the same hierarchy as those other acts I've mentioned. For example, there's footage in the film of Lips on an afternoon chat show having to discuss the lyrics of Toe Jam. What's it about? And you think, this is rock what do you think it's about so they did all the kind of rock and roll things but then when he finds them he finds a band who they're part-time musicians lips drives trucks for a catering company robs in construction and paints in the spare time one of the guitarists glenn is basically living in a car and has his stuff in a garage the other one's missed his mortgage payments the shows that they're getting are just playing to core fans in their hometown. And they do interview people like Lars Ulrich from Metallica and Slash from Guns N' Roses. And they were saying, you know, we thought they'd be big with us. And what has happened to them? The European fan, who's actually the other guitarist's girlfriend, who offers to set them up with a European tour. 
starts off well. They play this Sweden Rock Festival, but then it all starts going downhill from there. They miss their trains. They play to not so much half-empty venues, but a handful of people who happen to be in the bar anyway. I think quite a few up-and-coming bands have had to put up with that. A promoter who won't pay them, just an overall lack of promotion. So they limp home with their tail between their legs. When you're watching this, you're thinking, ha ha, this is also Spinal Tap, isn't it? And Spinal Tap, don't forget, is based on a distillation of different metal bands and what has happened to them. Every band has had, a, for example, a Hello Cleveland moment. And although you don't see it in this, I imagine Anvil, in the many gigs they've played, have had a Hello Cleveland moment. You do kind of laugh at the whole situation, think this is terrible, and there are a bunch of delusions you really need to grow up. But then the more you get to know Lips and Rob, the more you think this is all they've ever known. They've known each other since they were teenagers, possibly younger, and all they've known is playing in a band. After a while, you realise it doesn't matter if I like the music or not. First of all, you think it's about the music, but then you think, no, it's not about the music. It suddenly switches to a film about friendship and having the conviction to go on and do what you like, regardless of what other people think of it, regardless how successful or unsuccessful it is. There's one bit for me which really sums it up. Lips is fretting over the fact that everything relies on him. What would I do if I chuck myself off a cliff? And Rob suddenly steps in and says, I wouldn't let you. Lips is obviously quite surprised by this. Rob is very much the strong silent type and is always the barometer, the grinding thing with Lips sometimes loses the plot. That, for me, summed it all up. Just Rob suddenly saying, I wouldn't let you throw yourself off a cliff. Rhonda, Lips' wife, supports him. The fact that he had to go on tour about three days after the child was born, she seems kind of quite prosaic about it. This is what it's like being married to a rock star. One family member called Droid, she thinks they should both grow up and get proper jobs. Lips tries telesales, and as someone who's done telesales, I can tell you it's a really soul-destroying job, especially cold going. You feel like the scum of the earth, and you're made to feel like the scum of the earth, and of course, it's just not for him. They get in touch with a producer, Chris Sangaridis, or CT for short, who did produce one of their albums and has then gone on to produce other bands of that genre. He says he'll do a new album for him for $13,000, or is it pounds? Anyway, 13000 lots of money for them. They have to try and raise it. They take on extra work. Eventually, Lips' sister gives him the money. So off they go to Dover to record the album with Chris Sangaridis. And you think, well, this is it. This is make or break. What they've said to their families is, this is it. This is the last one we're going to go. It's going to, we're going to call it This is 13, and hopefully it'll be the lucky 13 for us. The film follows them there. Lips and Rob have a falling out. Rob quits the band. And it looks like the whole sessions are going to fall apart. CT tries to patch things up. But then again, Lips and Rob realise that they need each other, that for better or worse, they're like brothers from different mothers. They're bonded by this band, this love of music that they want to make. And what's important to them is making music. And that's what they want to do. They pull through and make the album. EMI Canada just aren't interested. But then suddenly the internet happens. The sales pick up. They get a offer to do a rock festival in Japan. Problem is they're playing first thing in the morning and they think nobody will turn up and they walk on stage and it's packed, absolutely packed full of fans. And so the movie ends on a high that people are buying the album. They're able to sell it themselves. They're getting the gigs. This film, actually when it came out, they then would sometimes play gigs to accompany showings of it. And so it all picked up. I'm not spoiling anything really by saying that Whenever the Blu-ray was reissued and they did Where Are Anvil Now, I'm pleased to say that as a result of this film, they are now full-time musicians and they've never had to work again. And their early albums, which had titles like Toe Jam on it and March of the Crabs and Metal on Metal, are being reissued. So they're having a second life. Now, I'm not a metal fan. I'm not. Just doesn't do anything for me. The most metal I have in the house, and I think to myself, is this even metal? Is a bit of Def Leppard and a bit of Green's Right. I, well, I do have Spinal Tap and Bad News, but they're mock metal. But that's as metal as I go. Steve, do you have any metal? I was a big Led Zeppelin fan, and, and I still am, but I don't really listen to them that much anymore. I grew up thinking, I don't know, hope this isn't snobbery. <laughs> it probably <laughs> is, but they were kind of slightly above metal. I haven't listened to them for quite some time. It's really about being able to live your dream. And what really came across for me was the fact that these guys had bonded by metal, as it were, but this is the only thing they know. And trying to even get them to do something else, it's not what they were put on this earth to do. They were put on this earth to make metal and go out and play their music. This is what they're doing now. I mean, I'm not saying they're millionaires, 
I don't think they are, but they have enough money in the bank now that they don't have to take on part-time jobs and remortgage houses and live in cars and things like that. It's an interesting tonal shift that you start off laughing at these people, thinking, <laughs> this is also Spinal Tap, isn't it? Bad tour manager, you couldn't make it up. But then suddenly it becomes a film about friendship and one last shot of the dream, and will it pay off? Will Rhonda get her 13,000 back? That's the most important thing. You know? yeah. <laughs> Never mind will the album sell. Will Rhonda get her investment back? And will Glenn have to stop living in a car? I enjoyed it for that reason. In the same way, I'm not a Motorhead fan, but I found the Lemmy documentary incredibly fascinating because Lemmy's a fascinating character. These guys are fascinating characters. And whenever I'd posted on Facebook that I'd watched it, a friend of mine from Virgin, hello, Daniel, if you're listening, who's now living in the States, he posted a picture of him and Lips. And oh, he wow. said, the, yeah, exactly, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my God, it's Lips. And he said, Lips is the most down-to-earth, unrock character. Even now, he's just grateful for the fans. At the time, certainly a slight bit of surprise that anybody would be remotely interested in this band. But, you know, in the back of the movie, it all picked up. Whether the movie helped them or the Japan gig would have happened anyway, who knows? But it's just a feel-good movie, which is funny in parts. It's quite touching in parts. It's quite tense in parts. And it shows, in the same way that you were saying, acting isn't glamorous. Making an album isn't glamorous. If I was sitting around, one person doing their bit and the other one's fretting over the quality of the takes and the producer just trying to keep it all together and hopefully finish the thing. CT is the voice of reason for the whole thing. And I think had they tried to record it with a less professional producer, it probably would have all fallen apart. But Chris, in his career, has seen it all and dealt with it all. So he was just able to shepherd the thing to completion. Anyway, I've rocked on long enough, Steve. So yeah. flying V's in the air. What did you make of it? Well, I enjoyed it, although I'm not sure enjoyed is the word. I certainly enjoyed bits of it, and other bits were hard to watch. I mean, I liked the characters. There were times when I was a bit hacked off with lips because he's got the short fuse, and I didn't like the way he talked to Tiziana, their manager, a few times, the European manager. I can't remember where she's from, somewhere in Eastern Europe, but the time where he gives her a right tongue lashing and she's um, reduced to tears and another band member, I, can't, I couldn't quite make him out at the time, consoles her. I think that was the one she ended up marrying. He left the band to marry her. I liked it. I mean, I think Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle gets into the mindset of, of the writer and all of the kind of emotional roller coasters you go through. I felt like this really gets into the mindset of musicians, which is very similar. Uh, you know, the both creative artists, the despair, the times they're thinking, oh, why didn't I get a proper job? Because his, his siblings are like this upper middle class Jewish family. You know, there's an endocrinologist, there's businessmen. They're, they're all you know, highly successful. His parents were highly successful. And he's the one on his uppers because Anvil had this moment in the sun and then they just disappeared. And it's hard to watch when he's packing food for his day job. And it's hard to watch. I felt he's someone who doesn't know much about metal, particularly that kind of second wave of the 80s or late 70s, 80s. You could go into this film not knowing much about metal and enjoy it, whereas I think the problem with Mrs. Park and the Vicious Circle is you go into the film, if you don't know much about those writers, it's a much tougher watch, at least the first time round. I was going to ask you what are Anvil up to now. I'm glad they're doing so well. I follow them on Facebook just because I was interested to see what they're up to. And they're always posting about doing tours and concerts and how well they're going. I mean, I don't know what the attendance is like, but obviously it's enough and they're making enough money to keep going. Long may they reign or long may they have their second moment in the sun. Can I ask you something? And, yeah. and I don't know if there's any kind of set answer to this, but how long does it take to record an album? once you walk into the studio because when they're in Dover there's like title cards coming up like week eight and I was just like how long are they there I, I was quite shocked by that they seem to be there for ages no wonder they were getting tense with each other it depends who you are and how complex your album is I think something like that you could knock out in a month and also I think they've only got a month with CT to do it so they really have to concentrate I think that's part of the stress is that they only have a month I've known albums to take 18 months. Sorry, I'm, just, I'm not a producer. I'm just talking as a fan who reads up on these things. Then you've got, for example, the Guns N' Roses Chinese Democracy album, which took literally years, and the Stone Roses Second Coming. I think it depends on whether the songs are there or whether you write them in the studio. If you record the band live, then it's usually quite easy. It's when you've got loads of overdubs to do. Which, again, is very much part of the process in the same way that overdubbing one's lines shouldn't be seen as a failure. Overdubbing a musical part, that's par for the course. It's just how you make an album, especially a complex one. Depends, I think, on the technology involved, the budget, 
the band themselves, how much time they've got. I think with COVID, it probably revolutionized things and showed that people could work remotely. So it is possible for one person to be working on something and then send it to somebody else. So you don't have to be hanging around the studio too much. I think the simple answer is it depends. Depends how quickly yeah. the band want to get it done. Depends how long the producers are available for, or the studios available for. Depends how quickly the record company want it out. And it depends if they go into the studio with it all ready to go or whether they're writing and, and arranging in the studio. I think as well, record companies have realized that album tour, album tour, album tour every year just drives a band into the ground. And it's not healthy on anyone. And longevity, I think, is achieved by making an album when you're ready to do it and doing solo stuff or tours in between and just working at your own pace. Painful lessons that have finally been learned, I would like to think. So the answer to your question is, Steve, it depends. Why uh, are you thinking of making an album? Uh, no, no, right. I think I should call Sasha Gervaisi, tell him to come round and record me doing that. I think that would be interesting. Uh, it would be funny for all the wrong reasons. What has Sasha Gervaisi also done? Because some of his footage, I was impressed. Because he must have been torn because he's a fan, but then he's filming moments when they're being humiliated, particularly when they're in Prague, and they turn up late for a gig because they got lost, and the guy refuses to pay them, and then Lips pins the guy against the wall. It's something that would be a borderline assault, actually. I'd expect if that got any nastier, there'd have to be an intervention, even if the guy does owe you money. I, I wonder if he was ever torn on this project. Has he ever said? Because there are times when you feel like, oh, you couldn't catch these guys any lower. I think a good documentary shows the good and the bad, and I think, like your biography, the level of cooperation, I think it's do they cooperate, but they don't get to dictate what you film? There may well have been moments where they just may have said, just turn the cameras off. But usually they make it into a documentary so people can see when they were asked to turn the cameras off. But I think one of the rules of documentary making is you don't step in. So even if Lips had started punching this guy, really pounding him, I think the documentary crew would have just hoped that somebody else would step in. A good documentary shows the bad with the good. If it was all good stuff, it would be a press release or an electronic press kit. Any good documentary gets under the subject and shows the balance is bad and good. But yes, they, it does join them at a really low ebb and you do feel for them that no wonder he wants to punch his lights out. And the fact that this is Lips doing it, who's normally at other times is quite a calm character, is quite something. Sasha's also done, he wrote The Terminal. He directed Hitchcock. The most recent thing he's done is direct and write and produce My Dinner with Hervé. Oh, I've heard about that, Hervé Villachez from The Man with the Golden Gun. I haven't seen any of that. I haven't seen Hitchcock, and that's about the making a psycho, right? Okay, he's nailed the story behind the story type films. It seems like that's his specialty. And he does a grand job here. Will you be checking out in the Anvil? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe on YouTube, because I don't really buy albums anymore. I'm sorry. I, I, I think, you know, the whole internet has killed uh, the album is kind of accurate, but I will check them out on YouTube. Certainly, I thought, particularly that scene back in the heyday when they were being grilled on a chat show about the lyrics, their lyrics were kind of clever. They were smutty, but they were clever. And I thought, oh, yeah, these guys have got talent. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll check out a bit of Anvil and uh, toast their success. It's been a long time coming, but, uh, you know, they got there, so I'll never give up. Rock on, oh, Steve. Indeed, yeah, rock on. <laughs> and it's a shame this isn't video because I'm doing the flying Vs right now, Steve. Yeah, rock on. Right, okay, yeah. 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 I'm doing a bit of crowd surfing right now. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just, right. Yeah, I just have to take my word for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Neither of us have got the hair to head bang anymore, so, you know, we'll do something. Th that's true, yeah, that's true. Although there was that moment in lockdown when everybody had hair like a rock star. <laughs> I, I know I did. I did the full long hair thing. I looked more like Aquaman, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and on well, that bombshell, maybe... do you want yeah, to wrap it up? Yeah. I think I'm flattering myself because he's got quite the following. I'm not not yeah. quite as bulky and as as, as well built as Aquaman, but he, it was that long. But uh, yeah, on that bombshell, I think perhaps we should wrap up. Well, thank you, dear listener. Thank you for joining us and for listening to us describe two films that show the trials and tribulations, the highs and lows of creative artists. Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, a biopic about Dorothy Parker and many writers by Alan Rudolph was my recommendation, and I hope you check it out. And Anvil, a hilarious rockumentary about the, the titular Canadian heavy metal band. 
And Vol, I hope you check out that film and I hope you check out the music. Yeah, check out the music, check out the writing of people who have suffered for their art and want you to suffer through it with them. And thank you for suffering through our, our humble podcast, dear listener. And we'll be back very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. You've been listening to Highbrow Lowbrow, presented by Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery. We'd love to hear from you, and you can contact us by going to our link tree. That's linkpr.ee forward slash highbrow lowbrow. Until next time, keep it highbrow and lowbrow.